Crown Produce secures produce locally and from around the world for Canadian retailers. Crown Produce is also proud to secure sponsorship of University Football on Shaw. Crown Produce, supporting Canadian retailers and Canadian amateur football. Hey everybody, welcome to the season finale of Touchdown BC. I'm Andrew Wadden. and of course I'm joined each and every week by the lovely and talented Ryan Sullivan. Ryan, there seems to be some sort of monopoly going on when it comes to island teams in amateur football in BC. We had the VI Raiders win the BCFC. We had the VMFL Championship featuring Nanaimo, and uh, we also have the Double A Final for BC High School Football with John Barsby in it, but you also have another team that is in the Triple A Final that's looking for number three in a row. I was getting really excited. I thought that you were going to talk about Monopoly, and you know that I love Monopoly and that I play competitively, but then you wanted to talk about You're in a pro league of some sort, are you not? Yeah, you wanted to talk about island football. So you know what? Let's do that. Let's keep talking island football. They were representing this past weekend at BC Place, the Mount Douglas Rams taking on the Terry Fox Ravens for the Subway Bowl Championship. It's time once again for the final game. This one is for the banner and the trophy. Connor McKee and the Terry Fox Ravens taking on Marcus Davis and the Mount Douglas Rams opening series of this game. McKee gets lit up. Absolutely dropped like a sack of Yukon Golds. Byron McKinnon, the man laying the damage. McKee gets right back up though. He'd shake it off, nicely done. They'd have to punt and this one is off the side of the foot and out of bounds, a brutal boot. Giving Mount D some pretty good field position. They take advantage. First play is a screen to Davis and he's gone. He finds himself 12 yards with ease. They'd go to Davis again on the ground and this time he makes absolutely no mistake. A nice weaving through traffic. Rams draw first blood. However, that extra point, not the greatest. They lose the handle. That's no good. It's six nothing Douglas. So Terry Fox right back the other way and it's Michael West with a huge run. The big man right up the can. That's an easy first down. They go for it on fourth and the pass not even close. McKee overshoots his man so it's Mount Doug ball. They'd march it upfield and they'd go right back to who else? Marcus Davis. He takes this one to the outside. There's 14 yards for MD and they'd keep moving. Rams switch things up and go to Julian Luis. A tremendous effort. Laundry would hit the field, the penalty against Terry Fox, but they'd also rule Luis out at the one. So on the fake, Ashton McKinnon takes it himself, calls his own number, put that on the board. However, convert trouble strike again. The two pointer falls incomplete. So Mount Doug leads 12 blank. Fox in need of a juice boost and they'd get it on the kick return. Keyshawn Ross, he finds himself a nice looking hole, a little gap and he books it towards the outside. Ross finally forced out at the 28 yard line. A great return by Keyshawn and the Ravens are showing some signs of life. McKee then hands it off to West and he finds some decent yardage up the outside. That's a T-Fox first down and then some. McKee then inside the red zone would get dropped again by Byron McKinnon, a nice wrap up tackle textbook and Fox would have to settle for a triple attempt. One that, well, just does not have the distance. 12 nothing Rams, the score would remain on the no good FG try. Mount Doug would do nothing with it. McKee then decides to take things into his own hands. He'd try things out himself. He finds some room and gets those legs churning. Like a young Seneca Wallace out there, he's got himself a first and then some. McKee then fakes the handoff and finds loads of running room. C-Max 7 finds the first down at almost the end zone. So it ended up being a Michael West punch in. And that is exactly what he does. A nice punch and he is in. Fox fans in a frenzy. Who doesn't love alliteration? It's 12-7 for the Rams. They keep it coming though as Marcus Davis goes to wide out. 
makes the grab and finds some real estate. He crosses the field and finally gets forced out at the 16-yard line. They would then call upon Seye Faranu, the forgotten man on most nights. Not on this one, though. That's a Mount Doug major, and they would keep adding to the lead. After a few changes of possession, McKinnon on the option, loses the handle. Fox recovers with great field position and a chance to take the lead before the half. They'd have to settle for a triple, though. And a little more Eric Snow, a little less JT Snow, if you know what I mean, with the arc there. This line drive seals wide. Fox would trail going into the second half. McKinnon would figure out the option to start the third cue. He hits Davis and see ya. Davis weaves in and out of traffic again like he's done all year. This kid is ridiculous. Touchdown Rams and they keep rolling to start the second half. Keyshawn Ross though, the one bright spot for the Ravens in this one. He sets up Fox again with some more tremendous field position. He cuts through the middle and then he heads towards False Creek. Another great run from Ross. And you thought Ross is only known for the brand names and prices. You were wrong. McKee then capitalizes. He finds trouble but then finds greener pastures. Cuts it up the middle. A tremendous run from one of the league's best scrambling QBs. Fox not going down without a fight. Oh, gorgeous. McKinnon and the Rams would go back to work though. They go to the air for a change and it's Alexis Kapini with the grab wide open, a huge first down, then it's who else? Marcus Davis capping off the drive, another Mount Doug major. So, McKee and the Ravens trailing by 12, need to get moving here in the fourth. He finds Nick Agnoletto up the middle for a moving of the chains. Then he goes to Brad Peters, another Fox first down. He would then complete the drive on the ground, the handoff to Kyle DeGau, and it's a one possession game with time ticking down. The Ravens D would hold off the Rams to give the O one last chance. However, the pass is picked by who else? Marcus Davis getting the job done on both sides of the ball. McKee put a little too much loft under this one. Davis absolutely uncontested, and that would be all she wrote. In terms of team sports, can there be many better for Vancouver Island? Maybe those old Victoria Vikings teams and Vikettes teams that won all those CIS championships, but in terms of high school, it doesn't get much better than this. The three-peat has been achieved by the Mount Douglas Rams. Mount Doug with the 32-27 win. The Mount Douglas Rams are your 2013 champs. All right, double A time now in the BC High School Football Championship. John Barsby Bulldogs facing off against the Carson Graham Eagles. Who would take it? A lively, possibly even rowdy crowd of supporters came out for this clash between the two double A Titans. The Eagles wasting little time moving the pigskin as star running back A.J. Blackwell out of the Wildcat moves the sticks and then some, bringing C-Dub into the bars beat red zone. A.J. B. then hands it off to Russell Tolatino who, like a Tarantino film, finds Moneyland. C-Dub scratches the scoreboard first. Get it? Tarantino? Moneyland? Yeah, whatever. But the Bulldogs don't back down deep in the Eagles zone. Kevin Boylet punches in the major tie ball game. But hold up, the Stripes got together to discuss whether he was down before the goal line. They concur that he was down, so they'll have to do it all over again. This time, North Rainey, that's right, his name is North Rainey. Not sure why that intrigues me so much. However, Blackwell couldn't be held down. He busts through the pack and finds Moneyland, looking like a young Emmett Smith in that number 22. Eagles take the lead, and they go for the PAT. Bonk! Off the upright, no good. Barsby would drive downfield inside the Eagles' 10. Brody Taylor floats one up for Kelvin Kellogg. K-squared comes down with it. They would missed the PAT, so we're locked once again, this time at 13. C-Dub, though, wouldn't stop pressing. Mo Moshini, his friends call him Momo, Connects with Sam Williams, who goes down inside the Bulldogs' five. So Blackwell, out of the Wildcat again, tosses the pigskin to Lukesville. The PAT would be good. Eagles take a 20-13 lead. Late in the game now, Bulldogs driving. 
Taylor drops back, goes to the air. Cole Vertanen comes down with the leather. Dogs down one. So they go for the two-point conversion. Boylette almost goes down, but he crosses the goal line. Bulldogs up one. Holy cow. Under 10 seconds to go. Moschini finds his man to move the chains. Momo hits another man to put the Eagles into field goal range. Barsby thinks the game is over. The Stripes have to discuss it. They conclude that the Eagles call the timeout with one second remaining. So they go for a 37-yard field goal for the win. No, sir. The officials ruled that the ball was not snapped quickly enough after the timeout. Tanner Bohm left with no chance to win it for the Carson Graham Eagles. Dejection for the Eagles. Elation for the Bulldogs. Barsby takes the AA championship in controversial style. Okay, let's wrap up this whirlwind of BC amateur football with the VMFL championship game. The Cowichan Bulldogs, no, they were not in the game. They were knocked off by the Nanaimo Redmen. They're facing off against the North Surrey, the Bears. Let's see how it all went down. Pick this one up late in the fourth queue. North Surrey nails this 34 yard field goal. That put the Bears up 11-3. Under five minutes to go now. Redmond pivot. Austin Lyle goes to the air. Marcus Severe comes down with the pigskin. He takes it 70 yards all the way to the house. Islanders down two. So they go for the two-point convert. Lyles hits Jake Basario on the swing pass. We got a tie ball game. On the ensuing drive for the Bears, David Legault can't hold on to the biscuit. The Redmen recovered on the North Surrey 22-yard line, where Basario would punch it in from 10 yards out. The conversion would be no good. Nanaimo comes all the way back from down eight to take a six-point lead. Ensuing kickoff, disaster for the Bears. Legault looks to have the seam, but Redmond linebacker Ethan Schultz drills him, topping the pigskin loose. Nanaimo recovers. They kill down the clock. Go for a three-banger, but it gets botched. Bears with one last-ditch effort, but the Redmond defensive front get to the Bears' pivot. Nanaimo ends its 18-year drought of provincial titles, beating North Surrey 17-11. Here's the rest of your championship scores from around BC Community Football. Okay, Ryan, so that's the highlights from everything that happened this year in uh, BC Amateur Football. We had a great season, really. Uh, SFU, maybe not so much. UBC, oh, you know, they're getting there, although there might be some political strife that they have to get through. However, the high school championships were fantastic. And coming up, we've got Farhan Lauji with the Magic 8-Ball head himself. You know who I'm talking about? Uh, I'm going to pretend that I don't know who you're talking about because he signs our checks. Jim Mullins coming right up with Farhan Lauji from BC High School Football and TSN. Whether it's your first home, a refinance, or an investment property, Kia Grant & Associates can find a mortgage solution for you. In association with Barrico Paragon, the work she does for you is free. Find her on Facebook at Kia Grant Mortgages. <laughs> And welcome back to Touchdown BC. Time to take a look back at the high school football season. And we'll do it with Farhan Lalji, the head coach of the New Westminster Hayaks. Of course, some of you may know him from TSN. But Farhan, it looks like you're in full coaching mode there. Yeah, I just met with a few of my players, in fact. So, I, you know, I haven't shaved. I haven't got the TSN makeup or any of that. So you'll have to take me as I am here. Uh, let's take a look back at the year that was in AAA football. I don't think we're really surprised that the Mount Douglas Rams found a way to win their third championship in a row. But, man, Terry Fox in that AAA final really gave them a push. They would not go away in that Subway Bowl. Yeah, you know, it was really, in my mind, a mirror of the game the previous week against Lord Tweedsmere. And you got to give both those programs um, a lot of uh, props for finding a way to stay in with it with the team that was that good. And there were a couple of moments in the semi and a couple of moments in the final where Mount Doug appeared to be on the verge of tipping them over. And both of those teams found a way to kind of hang on and stay in the game. And, and then in the end, in both games, uh, it came down to a Marcus Davis interception. And, uh, you know, so as, as good as Mount Douglas was, and I certainly believe they're provincial champions, uh, I take my hat off to both Tweedsmere and Fox for being able to uh, stick with them for a while. 
Now, Julio Caravetta on our broadcast made the bold statement that Marcus Davis may be the best high school player of all time coming out of BC. When you look at the numbers, pretty hard not to argue with that. Uh, what do you think of that statement? Well, I think it's, um, I, I think it's a, a reasonable suggestion. Am I willing to go that far and say he's definitively the, the best player ever? I'm not sure. I mean, there have been some really good ones here over the years, uh, including other guys at the running back position. You look at, you know, John Cornish and, uh, and Calvin McCarty and Reg Bradshaw, and there's been so many others if you take it back 30 years to the Glenn Steels and things like that. So difficult to compare eras. Athletes get better in every sport as we go. Um, I don't know that we've ever seen anybody as fast. You know, he ran a 4.39. Marcus did at the Arizona State University camp this summer. I mean, there were times when he looked like he was running past everybody and still in third gear. Um, and he certainly was a level above. You know, I don't think there was anybody that was able to stop him. Malik Irons was an unbelievable player, but there were some games that he was able to get contained. Nobody was able to get a handle on, on Marcus at any point in the season. Uh, of the uh, players that are out there, I'm told with every coaching staff that I talk to, there are six or seven good athletes or even great athletes here uh, in BC. Who's on that list in your mind outside of some of the names that you mentioned? Are you talking about for this year? This year, the, with, with, in terms of recruiting this year. Well, I, I think the top guys, I mean, you look at Marcus, there's two guys on his team, actually three guys on his team. Uh, those two linemen, Christian Kraus and Zach Wilkinson, are by far and away uh, the top two linemen in the province, in my estimation. Uh, and they've probably got five collegiate-level players starting on that offensive line at Mount Douglas. So those two guys really, really stand out to me. I remember watching Christian Kraus when he was a 10th grader starting on the varsity team and, you know, in a game against Vancouver College in a fourth and one splitting the defense and, getting into the backfield, and he was this size then. Um, you know, and Zach uh, certainly has developed. Malik Irons, we mentioned him as well. Um, there's, uh, you know, th there's other guys uh, province-wide. You know, there's some, some really good players uh, at Terry Fox. Uh, Shamatutu is an exceptional player. Uh, they've got some linemen that are pretty good there. Jamel Lyles, I can't forget him at, uh, at uh, Lord Tweedsmer. He's an outstanding player. I mean, those three backs, Irons, Davis, and Lyles, you know, as good a threesome as we've ever had here for sure. Um, Ashton McKinnon, the quarterback at Mount Douglas, uh, is another really good player. Uh, Malcolm Lee, the receiver at St. Thomas More. There's a number of them. Uh, it's, it's a really high-end crop of talent in BC this year. What is the one good news story that flew under the radar for everyone who was uh, maybe uh, casually looking at uh, BC high school football this year? Uh, well, good news story, you know, there, there's so much good news, but I, I think for me, you know, what, what's really good news is our registration hasn't dropped. And when you look at what's going on in the sport right now and, you know, so much hand-wringing on the concussion issue and uh, parents concerned and, and, you know, how registration rates have fluctuated in other parts of North America, but in BC, we managed to hold strong. So uh, I think that was a really good news story. You know, there's a, a young program out there, GW Graham, out in Chilliwack that was in the grade eight championship a year ago. They wound up winning the double A title uh, in, um, in junior varsity this year. Carson Graham, who was a powerful triple A program, they took a step back to double A and, and they wound up being in the final and just a, a hair away from winning it. So there, there are a few good stories out there. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to add a, another program likely next fall. So, you know, while, while everybody's worried about the growth of the sport, the growth of it is, is still good and high school football in BC is alive and well. Farhan, thanks very much for this. Appreciate your time. Anytime, Jim. The purpose of the Subway's All-Star Awards Banquet is to recognize high school athletes, namely football players, uh, not just what they do on the field, but um, in the classroom and in the community as well. We're also recognizing uh, nine scholarship recipients. These individuals are, they excel, they're over 90% averages in all their classes. They are very successful on the football field, but they also give back to the community. They're volunteers at uh, hospitals and Red Cross and different organizations that are important to them, and it makes them a well-rounded individual. Welcome to the 2013 Subway All-Star Awards Banquet. It's really important, like we can scout out, like know how good the other players are, and uh, see how they've done this season, and seeing their off-season workouts uh, awarded during the banquet. You just get to see who's kind of outstanding for teams, because really, when you're playing the game, you don't really get to see exactly how good they are, but then. You get to see some highlights, you get to 
see what the person looks like outside of the gear. From the Windsor Dukes, quarterback, Ty Marshall. Well, it means everything to me. Uh, you know, I look back on my career and everything that I have pretty much is, is because of football. Um, you know, it was a great uh, learning experience for me in high school. It taught me everything. Um, and then getting the chance to go on and play in university at Simon Fraser was, a, you know, for me was the, the ultimate. And then getting an opportunity to play eight years as a professional uh, was even better. It's important to everybody in there because it's showing uh, the reward of their hard work. I think it's important that they get recognized for the hard work. I think that one of the things that stands out to me, you know, I see the, the evolution of football in this province and from the grassroots level and how this banquet has grown and how everything has grown is that these kids are getting top-notch coaching, they're getting top-notch training, and you can see the benefits now at the professional level. Crown Produce secures produce locally and from around the world for Canadian retailers. Crown Produce is also proud to secure sponsorship of University Football on Shaw. Crown Produce, supporting Canadian retailers and Canadian amateur football. Hey, welcome back to Touchdown BC. Now, we just heard from Farhan Lalji about BC high school football. Now, we're going to talk about amateur football throughout the rest of the province. And we have with us the one and only Jim Mullen. I'm back. I'm yeah. back, baby. I know, I know. I rallied and I protested, but you're, you're back. So Be on your best behavior. Yeah. As you mentioned earlier in the show, I sign your checks. Yeah, this is very true. All right, let's talk some VMFL. What is the future of Vancouver mainland football? Well, it, it is a bit of a challenge right now when it comes to minor football uh, in BC, especially in towards the city of Vancouver. Before the start of this year, uh, we had a program uh, packet in in Burnaby, and we had the storied Renfrew Trojans uh, program packet in as well. Uh, certainly there's challenges in the urban core, but uh, in the valley, in the suburbs, on the island, that is where it's strongest. One thing that I'd personally like to see is maybe uh, community football taking a look at the OVFL model of moving their games, at least for the older guys, into the spring and into the summer. It's been very successful in Ontario, and it allows a player to get more reps at some of those key skilled positions. So. Uh, maybe if uh, the powers that be when it comes to community football really take a look at things, they may want to take some of their older divisions and move them to spring. The biggest challenge there is just getting field time, though. Now, before we jump to the BCFC, there's been a lot of contract discussion with Blitz the Bulldog and the Cowich and Bulldogs. Will he be back next season? I can confirm that he signed a new seven-year deal in Duncan. Oh, phenomenal. Phenomenal. Seven years, and he gets paid in milk bones. Uh, we're going to talk BCFC <laughs> challenges ahead. Uh, the biggest challenge ahead for the BCFC is the West Shore Rebels right now. They're in a bit of uh, disarray. They really need to focus on uh, reorganizing in the South Island. You know, with all the success with the island teams in terms of high school and in terms of the VI Raiders up the road, you'd think it would be a natural fit, but uh, they certainly have some challenges. Uh, but I think the big one coming around the corner is the Okanagan Sun. The Okanagan Sun uh, will have their uh, application and their proposal in uh, to the UBCO Athletic Department and then forward to the Canada West in February. Uh, and then uh, looking forward from that, they're hoping to get word in August of next year whether or not they're moving into Canada West. There are a few concerns from some of the Canada West coaches right now in terms of having an odd number of teams. Some of the Prairie teams don't want to make two trips into BC because those are flights and uh, they really add up to your budget over time. Uh, but overall, it looks like the Okanagan Sun are well on their way to going into Canada West. And if that's the case, you're probably going to get a new and improved Apple Bowl there as well because the uh, city is really picking up the pace in terms of uh, looking at improvements. Because you mentioned the word university, it carries a lot more cachet than junior, either fortunately or unfortunately. I've said it many times, best pants in football, the Okanagan Sun would love to see those on the CIS field. Now let's jump over to SFU, GNAC, NCAA, Div 2. They're going a different direction. They let go of Dave Johnson at the end of the year. Where are they looking for head coach? Wow, what a start SFU had this year with two wins and that big win at Central, and then they just slid off the map. There were a couple of games that they were in that they should have won. I think firing Dave Johnson was premature. I think uh, 
a guy that was considered as uh, coach of the year one year isn't a bum the next. The guy knows what he's doing up there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they're looking far and wide uh, now for a new coach. Uh, you know, I'd look in, in one's own backyard. We just had Farhan Lalji on here. Here's a guy that built up the New Westminster High Axe program from essentially nothing. There's a local coach that you could look at as a potential uh, coach of SFU. Jacques Chapdelaine, the former offensive coordinator. If you want to take a guy from the pros and bring him back down in the university, there's another guy that you could look at. And another name I keep hearing all over the place, Ryan, is Jeff Reinbold, the former oh. head coach of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. That was a big disaster. Spent some time in Hawaii. That's right. And he spent some time at uh, Southern Methodist as well as a uh, – uh, receivers and backs coach and uh, he most recently he's with the Hamilton Tiger Cats year before he was with the Montreal Alouettes so you know he likes that NCAA Division II model uh, I think one of the big challenges for SFU too is to trying to decide what they're going to be when you got 31 American kids on your roster and you're operating in BC are you going to be this international type school that's operating up on the hill in front of 600 fans or are you going to reinvest in your community uh, I'm more on the side of reinvesting into the community, and we'll see where uh, this uh, head coaching process uh, takes the SFU clan. Well, they're off to a good start. Andrew Wadden just hired as the team's new towel boy for the next three seasons. That's a hell of a promotion for that guy. He couldn't uh, get the dog suit from Cowichan and go up the hill? Well, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking, that's a whole different level right there. <laughs> so uh, let's talk UBC now. A million questions put into one. What's happening? Well, uh, I was at the uh, press conference uh, called by Professor Toop out at UBC where he basically said that, oh, our process has been too transparent. Well, that's not the case at all. It hasn't been transparent enough. Uh, but what they've done is they've moved the timeline up to January the 15th, at least the first one, when they're going to decide which varsity sports move ahead and which ones will be under a secondary review. I think football's around at UBC for another 90 years. They're going into their 90th year uh, next year. Uh, I, I think that there are a number of individuals uh, around that table who are alumni, who are very deep pocketed and who've been very generous to that university to, before, who are probably going to be in a position where they're willing to step up and create a model like they have in Laval or in Carleton, where it's a private nonprofit model. My main concern is with the stadium, with the Thunderbird Stadium, because you know that the university that's built up 1.2 billion in terms of their endowment is looking at Thunderbird Stadium and looking at that property and seeing $300 million that they can get out of that property if they redevelop it. So where's the stadium going to be? Is there going to be matching funds then if the alumni step up? And I'm sure UBC is in, in the mood of just giving away land for free, even though there's talk of a land swap and a this potential new stadium. This is Vancouver. <laughs> we don't drill for oil in Vancouver, folks. We build condos in Vancouver, and we take out heritage institutions as a result. And drive so, Fiat. <laughs> that's right. That's what we do. <laughs> little Fiat. Little <laughs> tiny Fiat. This is how we do it. So, so I think at the end of the day, the stadium, I think, is a big question down the road. I think the football program will be around. I think one of the reasons they moved it back to January 15th is that they want to give Sean Olson and his crew the opportunity to go out and be able to recruit because they are taking some hits right now. I saw schools from all over Canada at that BC high school football game, uh, both the AA and the AAA. And the reason for that was they know that they've got an opening, not only with SFU not having a head coach, but with UBC being in limbo right now. There you go. Jim Mullen, thank you very much. All season long. Sorry, my hands are a little clammy. Yes, they are. The, the lights are hot in here, you know. For Andrew Wadden, a little early in the show, Farhan Lalji joining us as well, Jim Mullen to my right. My name is Ryan Sullivan. Thank you so much for joining us all season long, and we'll catch you again next fall.